Uh, hello everyone. Uh, we will start our next webinar soon because I can see that people still are joining the meeting. So let's give them uh, one or two minutes. Uh, just before we start, uh, I would like to uh, to notice that our webinar will be recorded and shared later on. Uh, and it is very important that please uh, send, uh, send in your questions through the Q&A button, which is on your right side, because chat is uh, uh, disabled. Uh, and uh, your, your microphones and cameras have been uh, turned, uh, turned off. Okay, I hope that uh, most of you uh, already joined our, meet uh, joined our meeting. Uh, so, today uh, we'll talk about how to improve the accuracy of bird counts in ImageJ, an open source software uh, program. And it will be presented by uh, Clive uh, Harford. Uh, just to start with, with that, I, I have to mention that uh, it is the first uh, Eurosight Remote Sensing webinar, the, the third in, in our se short series of, of webinars. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, just uh, two weeks ago and one month ago, we had uh, two other webinars. First was about uh, drones and their use in vegetation mapping. Uh, and the second, uh, uh, and the second was on use of uh, GIS, uh, particularly QGIS, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, ecological uh, service. Uh, and since now we'll focus uh, on uh, on bird camps and use of uh, not very. Uh, known uh, software uh, image J. Uh, my name is Wojtek Mruz and uh, uh, I, uh, I am from Eurosight Secretariat. Uh, and, uh, and just to start with our, with our meeting, I would like to, uh, to hand over uh, to my colleague from the Secretariat uh, who uh, will tell you a little more about Eurosight, uh, Eurosight network. Uh, so I would like to invite here uh, Christian uh, Cibic uh, uh, from Eurosight Secretariat to tell you a little more about our uh, network. Hello, Chris. Can I can I see you? Good morning, everybody. Ah, great. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will tell you something very briefly about your site and I apologize to those of you who have attended our previous webinars and heard this once or twice before. But uh, for the benefit of those who are new here, I will, I will try to be short. So, uh, well, we are your site, the European Land Conservation Network. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, we are an uh, our pr primary goal is an exchange of knowledge. So we are providing opportunities for the nature practitioners to network and exchange experience and knowledge on practical site management since 1989. So this means we are uh, more than 30 years old and actually we celebrated our 30th birthday last year. Uh, so what do we stand for and how we uh, do this networking? Um, we help our members to share their experience and knowledge and their contacts and influence. And by doing this uh, with each other, they actually in return gain uh, support for their work and also uh, they develop themselves professionally. Uh, we help networking by providing guidance, uh, convening meetings on different topics uh, of relevance for our members. Uh, we try to organize workshops and training we we facilitate and run thematic working groups uh, we also help create project partnerships 
disseminate information and we represent our members at the European level meetings. Uh, we try to advocate for the issues that are important for our members. We are also a unique organization in the sense that uh, we work both with governmental and non-governmental organizations and individuals uh, across whole Europe and across uh, various topics, but uh, always uh, for having in mind the, the practical aspects of day-to-day -day site management and uh, land conservation. Uh, we try to actively involve all of our members uh, and the general kind of rule is actually the, the more active the members are, the more benefits they gain. And uh, we hope the network will uh, continue to grow uh, in the coming years. These are some of the topics we are uh, covering at the moment through uh, different working groups or thematic twinnings, as we also call them. So we have a, a working group on ecosystem services and how this concept can be, can be integrated in the site management in, in, in different ways. Uh, we also look at uh, wetlands and their role in um, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, especially through concept called natural climate buffers. Uh, as a network of site managers, we have a lot of uh, accumulated knowledge on management and management planning. So we also uh, provide uh, support on that to our members. Uh, this webinar is part of the work from our remote sensing support group. Uh, and we also have a peatland restoration management group because peatlands are a very important habitat uh, uh, responsible for a lot of CO2 emissions and could also be important CO2 storage if managed and restored properly. So uh, a quick overview uh, of uh, our network. This is the photo of us, of some of our members who attended our uh, anniversary 30th uh, annual meeting in Italy last year. And I would just say network is about people. And so here you see some of those people which are all very uh, eager to work together and learn from each other. And from those of you who were here, you might notice that the numbers have grown since uh, last or uh, since the previous webinars. We now have 66 members from 22 European countries. So uh, yeah, I hope uh, this trend continues and well, everybody's welcome to join the network. And in case you need uh, more information, you can all either ask here today or contact us through different uh, channels. That's all from me. Thank you very much. And now I give the uh, floor back to my colleague Wojtek. Thanks a lot, Chris, for this nice introduction. Uh, and uh, now we will start with, uh, with our presentation uh, about this image J and counting of birds. Uh, I would like just to uh, start it with a few words about uh, Clive Harford. Uh, uh, he has worked in conservation monitoring since late uh, 70s, initially as ornithologist in the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. Uh, and uh, after 20, uh, 27 years of working for the Welsh uh, conservation agencies, initially, initially the Countryside Council of Wales and then Natural Resources Wales, uh, he's now a freelance ecologist and founded uh, a new ecological monitoring consultancy, uh, consultancy called Serapias. Uh, and he is also uh, uh, he, he is a chair of our remote sensing support uh, group. And, uh, and I would like to ask uh, Clive also to say a few words about this group and later we will follow with, uh, with his uh, presentation. Clive? Could you join us? Yes, I am now. Okay. Right, thank you for that, Wojtek. Okay, I, I, what I'll do, I'll just say a few words about the, the background to the remote sensing support group. And again, apologies for those of you who have been at the previous webinars. This, this will only take a minute or two. So. Um, okay, so over the last uh, eight years or so, nine years perhaps, uh, we have been running every two years um, and the Tura 2000 monitoring workshop. So, uh, as, you know, with, with Eurosites, uh, 
Uh, these have been initially, I think the first one was in Wales and then uh, the next one in Catalonia, uh, then the Czech Republic and most recently in Spain last year in 2019. And uh, the, uh, the monitoring workshop in Spain was about remote sensing and the roles of remote sensing and new technologies in nature conservation and Natura 2000. And one of the outcomes of that was that uh, <clears throat> one, one of the suggestions there that was that Eurocite should try to form a, a support group for nature conservation practitioners uh, for remote sensing, uh, recognizing there was a gulf between the remote sensing technicians and the people on the ground who were mostly unaware of what the potential was and how much it could be done for nothing nowadays. So, um, so we started to do this within the group and uh, at this point in time, we have set up, uh, we have, uh, the aim has been to set up sort of a, a remote sensing stroke uh, nature conservation practitioner interface in as many countries as we can across Europe. And these are sort of what, what we would call uh, sort of learning hubs. So uh, each learning hub uh, would be uh, comprising two remote sensing technicians and at least one ecologist and uh, like I say th these are already um, in principle at least established in at least 13 different countries right across Europe and, and spread quite evenly from west to east. Uh, the general idea was this year we would start to run face-to-face -face, uh, meetings within each of these hubs or as many of the hubs as we could uh, in order to start the process of the face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, but because of COVID-19, we have not been able to do that. And actually that gave rise to this situation now, which to this series of webinars, which, uh, which has been quite well received. Now, all I will say now about the remote sensing support group is that we're hoping to run the face-to-face -face meetings next year. But if anyone here would like to contribute to these groups, uh, please feel free to, uh, well, more than that, I mean, we'd, we'd be pleased to hear from you it's, uh, through, through the Eurosite website. If so, if you leave a message on there, then we will get back to you. Um, okay, I guess that's all I really wanted to say about the remote sensing support group for now. So, uh, with, uh, from now on, I, I will switch now. I will uh, take control of the screen and we, we will start the presentation on the, the bird, uh, on the bird count. Okay, so okay, so you, you'll have to bear with me with this because uh, we, we know there is a slight lag on, on these things. Um, so at the moment, the, the presentation is opening, so it is quite slow at my end also. So, uh, okay, so I, I hope that you can all see this again. Okay, so I will just give a, a brief outline of what we're hoping to cover, or planning to cover now in the next uh, 45 minutes, something like this. Uh, firstly, um, it, I would like to do a, sh a short exercise to help give the problem a uh, personal perspective. So if, if you have uh, any, anything that you could write down, so just a handful of totals for, then uh, it, it would be, a, I think you would find it interesting. Um, after we have done that exercise, we will, I will show you the results of a study and observe the variation on bird counts. And then I will give you a demonstration on how to carry out automatic and manual bird counts in image J. And following that, we will have a Q&A session. And uh, for the Q&A, uh, as, as Soitek mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat, because if they go into the chat, we probably won't see them because we will be focusing on the Q&A, uh, on the Q&A questions that come into the Q&A box during the presentation. Uh, the plan is that we'll answer as many as we can before the end of the webinar, and any remaining questions we will pick up and reply by email later. Okay, so, 
So first an exercise. So in a few minutes, I will show you four images of flocks of birds. If you'd like to participate, uh, as I say, have something ready to record your estimates for each of the number of birds in each of the images. So there will be four images and I will give you about 15 seconds per image. Uh, and if you, if you can put an asterisk after your totals, if you are an experienced bird watcher, then this would be, uh, this would help also. Um, and then when you've done that, if, uh, if, if you can post your estimates numbered one to four in the chat box, then uh, what I will do is we will do an analysis of those and see how they, they look compared to the, the, the work, you know, the, the studies that we've already done. We will post the results of that on the Eurosite website when, uh, when, when the presentation is posted there also. Okay, so uh, I, will, I will start the, uh, the process now. So I, I will put up four images in sequence with a 15 second on each. Okay, so here is the first one. Okay, so that was flamingos, of course. Okay, this is golden plovers. This is number two. Number three, this is linnets with the, the odd gold finch in there also. So this is image number three. And finally, uh, we save the best till last, which is uh, a flock of starlings, of course. I think I could leave that one all day up, up all day. It would not make much difference. I think. Okay, so. Now I will present the results of a study and observer variation uh, that, that we did use in those four photographs, those images. So uh, what we did, we, uh, I, I sent these images to more than 30 experienced ornithologists uh, in Europe, many of them professional, but all who contribute regularly to uh, national count data. Um, the only rule was that the observers were not allowed to spend more than 30 seconds studying the image before making their estimate. Uh, it was, however, it was not a controlled study, uh, so it's possible that some observers took more time. Uh, 30 seconds, it, you know, it's, it's a reasonably generous time limit, but, uh, you know, rarely does a flock of birds take more than 30 seconds to fly past, and uh, they, they never, in fact, uh, sort of stop still for you to have a, a reasonable chance of counting them. So I thought I felt that that was a reasonable thing, because generally people, they, they start to make a count, then they, they make their estimate quite quickly when they're out in the field. Okay, so, the, so as I said, image one, this was uh, greater flamingos. And this was the photograph, the same one that you saw just now. And this is the range of estimates that were uh, provided by the 30 experienced ornithologists. So the actual count is the white column here. So there were actually 969 birds. Okay. Uh, and as you can see that, uh, you know, the spread was from 200 to 1700. And uh, very few bird watchers, uh, very few of the estimates were within uh, 200. And in fact, 80% 80, 80 of the ornithologists underestimated the number of birds. And then this is quite interesting because, well, as you will see, uh, and equally interesting is the, the bird watchers who are the ornithologists that uh, overestimated, actually overestimated by, by quite a long way in many cases. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't so marginal. Okay, so uh, the golden plover image, uh, again, the same one that you did. So th this was the range of estimates associated with that. So, so now the, the estimate here was from 150 birds up to 2,350. So the range was quite large. 
exactly the same pattern, about 80% underestimating, and relatively small number, uh, sort of um, pa perhaps six within 100, six ornithologists within 100 of how many birds there were. So, uh, so you, you see it's exactly the same pattern. Um, image three, this was the linnets. Um, and again, the same pattern. And I've had to remove one of the counts here. So there were, <laughs> because the last count was so much over the, you know, the overestimate was so high that actually you wouldn't have been able to see the pattern here at all. You, you, everything would have been pushed right down. So actually the, the range was much greater than shown here. I think it was um, from 100 to 3,800 or something like this. So it will probably cross that line. But here the actual number was 438. And yeah, again, a relatively small number. There was less variation associated with this image than the others. But there were less birds in this image than the others, so that perhaps is to be expected also. But the same pattern again, approximately 80% of the ornithologists and recorders underestimating the number of birds involved. The starlings image, uh, well, um, notoriously difficult, of course, and the range here was from 500 through to 47,800, and the actual number was just 11,117. Uh, only uh, two ornithologists were within 3,000 in that, in that, within 3,000 birds. Okay. So again, it, it, the same pattern again, just slightly over 80% uh, underestimating. And, and this is, seems to be a pattern right across the board. The problem is, of course, you don't know which one of these you are. Because mostly, you don't have 30 observers looking at the looking at the flock, and you don't know where you sit within that number. So you are one of those, but you don't know which one you are. And, and so <clears throat> the summary of the variation for the flamingos, the actual total was 969, lowest estimates uh, 200, highest estimates 1700, the median was 680, which is uh, minus 30%. Golden plovers, there were 842 in that image. The lowest estimate was 100, the highest was 1100, uh, minus 32% uh, was on the median, so underestimate by 32%. Linnets, uh, 458, the range from, yeah, so 150 to 3258. Uh, and underestimate, but not so great, 13%. Uh, and the starlings, 11,117, lowest estimate 500, highest 47,800 and a minus 57% uh, medium. Okay, so how can we minimize the, these sort of levels of, of observer variation on count data in birds? And, and bear in mind, you, 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 this probably would happen if you try to do it with any other species also. Um, yeah, and you know, some of the methods we talk here could be applied equally to other species, particularly plants, I guess. But, um, well, well, firstly, we have to accept there is a problem and we could be, be prepared to change. I mean, we have all these data sets uh, that show us um, the counts of waders uh, and, you know, these bird counts that appear in local bird reports and w where there is no training provided and no, valid, no subsequent validation. And there are no images or anything to, to show the, the counts that uh, uh, yeah, how many birds were present. So the, the first thing we need to do really is to take a camera out with us, to, you know, to learn to take a camera out with us when we are doing a bird count. And uh, not with a zoom lens, it's the, you know, the normal thing when you see an ornithologist walking around with a camera, they have a massive zoom lens on there where that, that would not be appropriate for recording a flock of birds. It, it need, you, you need to be, uh, if you're going out to count, you need to have a wide angle lens or a bridge stroke compact camera with a wide an angle function on it and manual control settings. Uh, put the settings here, that's, uh, you know, that, so th this presentation be online so you don't need to write down any of the details that can be shared. So there, there's some general uh, recommendations there for the manual settings. And you know, the closer you expect to see the flocks of birds, the, the wider the field of view you'll need in the camera. And the general, 
advice has to be, of course, is, is include as much of the flock of birds as possible within a single image. So it's not this essential. You can take several images across and then, of course, mosaic and, and go through that process. Um, and what you will learn is actually images of large flocks of small birds, well, waders and starlings. The best time to photograph them is they bank to one side or another because then the birds are side on and there's not so much overlap between them and overlap will be a problem. Okay, so okay, so when we have uh, obtained the images to count, we can then carry out the counts in image J. So, so image J, I mean, there are two, two forms, there's the image J itself and, and Fuji. And Fuji is uh, the, the sort of all singing, all dancing version, which has all the plugins already loaded up. But the image J that I downloaded yesterday also had the plugins you need to do this. So either is fine. I also had some problems with the Fuji website. So I actually couldn't download it. My, uh, my, my virus checker wasn't uh, letting me access it. So they might, they might have some issues there at the moment. But you can certainly download the normal image J, which does have the functions you need to carry out these counts. So, um, so it's an open source software. It doesn't cost anything. It was uh, developed initially for the use in hospitals, uh, typically for counting red and white blood cells and cancer cells and this type of thing. Uh, it is equally good for counting the number of birds or in a flock or flowers in a sward, etc. It is not. Uh, it does not care what it counts. It, um, as I say, the, the Fuji version comes complete with all the necessary plugins. But if you can't get that, the other is fine. And there's a link there at the bottom of the page to the to, food, uh, to the image J website. Okay, so now now comes the, the hard bit for me. I, I will give a demonstration, and we we're going to use probably the most difficult photo I have to try and give this demonstration. So it is a flock of starlings, uh, enumerating starlings, with quite a lot of overlapping birds in there. And um, okay, so now I will exit this. The presentation for a while and open image J. So, so when you open image J, you will you will get this sort of bar here at the top. And uh, again, all of the instructions you, you need to do what I'm going to do now are going to be included within the uh, within the webinar presentation. Uh, so you do not need to write anything down. So, so initially uh, you you open the image that you want to use. So, okay. Uh, Okay, so for this one, we're going to use Starlings for the webinar. That would be nice. One. So it can take a, a second or two to open the image. Okay, so here it is. So I will enlarge this. And I will also zoom in because the first thing you want to know um, is that what we are seeing is all birds. Okay, so. So you can see there's a lot of birds in this image and a lot of overlap and stuff like that. Um, I've, because I've looked at this image previously, uh, I, I'm quite familiar with it. So there are two problem areas, uh, two particular problem areas. One of them is th these are the most distant birds in the image. Okay, so if you zoom in in this area again. You have to, are you convinced these are all birds? And um, if you keep zooming in, well, what you have to look for is what the image J is going to do. It, it's going to count objects. Um, so are, are there any issues here? Uh, and then there, there are one or two, and we'll, we'll see them in a, in a second. But uh, I think initially when you do this, I'm happy that everything I can see here is actually birds. So at least in the image, there's not a lot of other noise in there. Uh, so provided the, the program can count what it's I'm seeing here, I'm, I'm going to be reasonably happy. It's given me a count of the number of birds. So, so okay, I, I will uh, reduce that. And so now, uh, actually, I, I will put it back in. Okay. So now I'm going to convert it to an 8-bit image, which takes the color out of it. 
Um, uh, now th this is one of the, the key parts of the exercise. I'm going to do a threshold. Um, this one, uh, that's fine. So we will start off with this one now. I will press apply. I can hear it working at the moment. In fact, I'm going to close this and start. I'm going to open this again. Sorry, let's, let's do this again. So we're going to open. This image. Okay, now uh, I'm going to address the, turn it into an 8-bit image. And now uh, we're going to address the threshold, which is what I'm trying to do previously. So there we are. Okay, so we have set this threshold. So now um, what we need to do now is check that what we are seeing here is the same as what we were seeing in the other image. Um, again, like I said, you'll have to bear with me a bit while I, while I sort of move between things here because it's quite important. If you get this part right here, then the rest of it should be fine also. Um, We want to be confident that what we can see in the, in the two images actually correspond. Okay, so, so there we are. If we concentrate on this part of the image um, in the bottom right of the image, then You know, generally speaking, the, the, the patterns are the same at least. But, but what we can do now, we can, we can sort of zoom in now. So let's zoom into the image and say view 100%. So now you can see the individual boots. And again, we will head across to that part of the image we were looking at where uh, the birds were furthest away. So, so okay, so. This is this part of the image here. So again, if we continue to zoom in and look at this, because it, like I say, if, if errors are going to uh, occur, then uh, this is the sort of place they will. Okay, so I don't know whether you can see this, but what has started to happen is that, that some of the bird's wings have started to separate. So you have the bird there and you have so this small dot here next to it, and and here also, and here also. So so this is a problem, and you can only fix this problem in, in the thread. Well, there are two ways you can do it. It's best to do it both ways because it, image J will count everything in the image. So you need to make sure that what it's counting is actual birds. So um, if you go back to the uh, the threshold in bar here, if you there's a there's a, count, a slider on the bottom here. If you slide it to the left, what you'll see is the birds start to fade. Okay, and they, they disintegrate. And at, at some point, you know, this all has an impact on what you're counting. So what you need to do is join the birds together as best you can. So uh, I found that somewhere actually round about here was about as good as it gets. Um, around about 99, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the other problem you have is that if you go too far in the opposite direction, if we go to the top of the image here, okay, so we get to there. If you start going in the opposite direction, as so you move in the slider to the right, you see dots start to appear. 
and gradually, you know, you don't have to go too far before all of these large objects start to, to appear. So, so you're trying to find the balance between having uh, a perfect representation of the birds, and, or as close as possible as you can get, and not introducing more noise. So at 99, there are still a few dots in here that aren't birds, and if you don't do something about that, then they, they will be counted. So the, the next part of the process, it, it, if we accept this is probably um, as good as we're going to get at the moment, uh, this is the best we can do it through the threshold in at least, uh, we, we can start to go to the count process. So if, if you <clears throat> type in this box, nor to infinity, it will count everything, everything it, even one pixel size will be counted and that would include these dots. So uh, if, if you start at eight pixels rather than zero, you know, at starting at zero, then anything less than eight pixels will be excluded from the image. Okay, and if we um, go to infinity, it will count everything in the image that is larger than eight pixels. So if we do this, um, and, uh, what you need to do, you have to make sure the outlines are ticked, for, so it will show uh, the outlines of the birds that have been counted and that we want to display the results, and we press OK. So now there should be a, a count taking place. OK. So here's the image of everything that the, the program has counted. And now you also have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. And it has counted uh, 13,203 objects in that image. So we can now zoom in and check to see what this has counted. Uh, so, okay, so again, we'll zoom to 100% in the, in the image. Okay, so now you can see the individual birds, and you see they uh, will zoom in, but they are all numbered now. So each object has a number, and this is the number on the left in the spreadsheet. And uh, so you can see exactly what has been counted. Uh, we'll zoom in again. So if we go across, again, let's go back to the two areas we looked at. Okay, so this is where you have to get your confidence from that the uh, that the counters work. Okay. So if we move this across to here for a second, and if we open the image and we zoom into here on the actual image. Uh, This is a bit slow at the moment, sorry. Uh, okay, so we're getting to that area. So, what we've got here is you can see that, uh, actually I need to drag this across a little bit. You have a group of five birds here. That uh, would be this five birds here. And there's another group of five birds to the right of that. And that would be this five birds here. And you can keep doing this, but at the moment, it's counted those five birds and it's counted those five birds, which are some of the smallest birds in the image. It has not counted anything else. So there are no small bits that have come off them. So by uh, setting the, the, the lower threshold to eight, then uh, that seems to have ruled out the problem of any uh, fragments that have broken off the bird. So I'm reasonably happy uh, having looked at the, the smallest birds in the image, that actually it, it is counting birds. It's not counting anything else in that. And we can check that at the top because we know that there was some, some noise that had come into the top left corner where there were some dots in the image. Okay, so you get to here. And again, if we uh, do the same thing on this image, 
Okay, so there are no dots if I zoom in a little bit more here. So nothing has been counted here. So none of those dots have been counted. We are left with the uh, with the birds that we could see. So um, okay, I'll let me zoom in again a little bit on this one. So okay. So we have a bird count at least, and we we have a minimum. Book. Count with the count that we were given this uh, this count of thirteen thousand two two six. That is the number of objects, and you can tell just by looking at the image here. There's lots of overlapping birds here, and in fact, the further you go into the image, the more overlapping birds you will see. Uh, so we know that it, that it, it's at least uh, thirteen thousand uh, two hundred and twenty six birds in this image. Uh, but if we want to take it any further than that, then we have to. Uh, we have to make some decisions. So, if if we look into this part of the image here again, this this part of the image has the largest, so the closest birds in this area uh, were here. So, uh, what we can do now, if we look at bird number one four six, um, we can go to the Excel file and go down to one four six, and we'll find out how many pixels that bird was. Uh, 145, I'm sorry, it's 145. So it is uh, 166 pixels, this bird here. And be below it, we can see that bird number number 218, it looks like it is two birds that are sort of overlapping here. So, um, so if we go to 218, sorry, it was 216. It is, uh, yeah, so it's this bird here, it's 216, which is 336 pixels. Um, so that that would be, if we said, for example, now that the um, an indi individual bird was probably, most of the individual birds in the image are probably 170 pixels or less, and most of the, uh, where you have two birds joined together, mostly they will be, around and about uh, 340, something like this. So if, if we use that, so we can test that again, we have a larger overlapping area of birds here, and this is 318, so we can test it again as we go down to here. So 318 is 621. So if our theory is right, so th this would be one bird, this would be two birds, and this would involve at least you know this according to this it would be four birds and it it doesn't look like it's terribly wrong on that it, it could possibly be another bird but but you you won't get this perfect if it most of the time it works like this uh, you, you're going to get very close at the end to what the actual number of birds involved is so how do you take it from there to uh, from where we are now to actually having a, an ac a relatively accurate count it won't be totally accurate but it'd be a lot more accurate than any other form that I have a way of doing this that I can find. So, so now if we go into the, so we, if we close this and we forget this count data, so we'll do away with that because we don't need it, so we don't want to save it. Now we go to analyze and analyze particles again. Now instead of eight to one into infinity, we will keep eight because we know that rules out the noise. And if we type in 170, then do the same thing and do a count. Uh, this should isolate all of the individual birds in here. Okay, so if we do okay, we should get the total for the. So now, in theory, all of the all of the objects less than one one hundred and seventy pixels and less are in this image here. And this says there are 11,542 individual birds. Of course, we can check this by zooming in. So we can zoom to 100% and we can zoom in again. And again, and you can see that these are mostly, they're, they're not totally right, but 
Um, there are clusters here, but actually there are lots of numbers on them. If you keep zooming in and zooming in, mostly they will be separated. Uh, and you know, certainly as you get to the edges and the less clustered places, it, it is individual birds it's counting. You can see this. Um, just the occasional one that's overlapping that has been included. And that's bound to happen more with the further, the further away the birds there are, the more chance there is that two birds close together will actually fall under the threshold of one very close bird. But you, you can get, a, you can, if you want, you could get a handle uh, on how often that is happening and extrapolating that. So anyway, so now you, you have a figure, this figure here for 11542, for the number of individual birds uh, in the image. And we know it's not 100% accurate, but it's not bad. So we, again, we can close this and close this. We won't save that measurement. And we'll do the same thing again. We will go to analyze particles. And now we will go to, we will put 171 here instead of, so the lower limit is now 171 and the upper limit will be 340. And this should give us a count and a map that shows the, or a plan showing the number of birds where two birds are overlapping. Okay, and we'll rule out all the, the birds we've just counted. Okay, so we press OK. So it's doing it again now. Now, of course, there are less of them, much less of them this time. 1,138. Okay, and again, we can zoom into 100%. And most of these, again, uh, you, can, you can see in lots of cases, it is actually two birds overlapping. Again, there will be occasions when it isn't that, but uh, in most cases here, that's actually what you're seeing. So, okay, at that point, I mean, you, you are getting that you should be getting the gist now that you, you can now go from 340 to 510. So 341 to 510 next, and that will give you a count of all the um, the clusters of three birds. Okay, and you keep going through the image until it reaches its logical conclusion. So. At this point, I will, I will close this, uh, this part of the, so that this is the automatic count part of the section. I will close these for the time being and go back to the presentation. Uh, so just bear with me a second. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this was the image that we've just started to count. Okay, so I actually did this, it took me about an hour, but this went through the process of doing what I just did. So we started with 11542, and then there were 1338 uh, uh, objects where there were two birds. So I went through that process and actually the count at the end came to 16,714. Okay. So uh, it, it's worth bearing in mind. I, I think only uh, one observer was within 3,000, I think, of the original Starling estimate. The first count we did, which was 13,226, even with all that overlap in there, without going through the rest of this process, was more accurate than 90% of ornithologists would be you know, doing that count, doing those estimates in the field, or, or even from a photograph without doing the counts. So. Um, I've put uh, other examples in here for you. I won't go through them now. They're just there for reference. So when I when I post this, um, and again, just showing you examples of this. So they're, they're the settings I use for the for the flamingo photograph. So again, there there are different ways of doing this. Uh, so so the pros and cons of the automatic cams. Okay, they, they, they can be very quick and far more accurate than counts in the field. But the one we've just looked at is, is probably, uh, you know, it, it's one of the more difficult ones. You know, it, it, a lot of overlap in it. If we did an automatic count of the Flamingo photograph, for example, uh, it, it would be much quicker. It, it, it would take minutes, really. But it might take you a little while to get the threshold settings on that because there's more, more stuff going on in the background. 
uh, for very large flocks of birds such as starlings is probably the only chance we have of getting a near accurate estimate. Um, as you could see, the program produces an, out, an, an image showing the numbered outlines of all the particles it has counted, and you can use that as part of the validation. It also produces that Excel file showing the pixel area of the objects it has counted, and again, you can use that to validate and to improve the count estimates as I did. Um, the downside is uh, you, you can only do them against a relatively plain black uh, background. Ideally, uh, sky or calm sea is the best uh, is the best chance. If there's any noise in the background, it gets really tricky and actually becomes impossible in some many cases. Uh, it can take a while to find the right settings for an automatic count. So in, you know, it could take you 40, 45 minutes. So by the time you finish messing around with the uh, the object sizes and the threshold. You know, it can take quite a while to get that balance right. Um, and the accuracy of the, the initial count will also, you have to bear in mind that initial count is compromised by overlapping birds. But we did just show a way of working through that. Okay, so now I'll give you a, a, do a demonstration of manual counts in, in image J. So in this situation, you have no chance of an automatic count. The, the, the automatic counter wouldn't be able to separate the guinea moths on this rock from the rock. It would, just would not be able to do it because the first thing you're going to do is going to remove the color anyway uh, from the image. So uh, what I will do now is we will switch back to image J and this is a much quicker, much quicker exercise now. So if we put uh, image J back up here and we start off again with, uh, we open the image we want. Okay, so now we want the uh, Giddy Moths for webinar. That would be a nice thing. Okay, so here is the image. This time we don't have to change it at all. Uh, we can go uh, straight to the plugins and go into analyze and go to the cell counter. Okay. So the first thing we have to do, we have to initialize, so click initialize, and now that image is initialized. And it's worth at this point having a look inside the, the image because what you can see here, first of all, is you've got the opportunity to count eight things at the same time. So if you have a mixed group of species in there, or if you're doing it for plants, you could imagine how you could do this actually. If you, if you wanted to do a, a head count of seeds, seed heads, or, or plants in a, or flowering plants in a sward, uh, maybe a drone image or something like this, or uh, looking down that gives you a chance. You, you could do exactly the same thing for a, a count of flowering plants or orchids or whatever. It doesn't have to be birds, you can do other stuff as well. But anyway, you can count up to eight species at the same time. Uh, it, it's worth us having a look in here to see what's actually in there, just to start off with. So if we zoom into 100%, and I think we can work at that level. What we find actually quite early in proceedings in this corner, they're not all guinea moths, there are a couple of great black back girls here. So, um, so if I move the cell counter across, if we select counter two type, uh, for the great black back girls, um, and then go to the pointer tool and left click on the bird. You'll see it's got markers left on it. So those two birds have been counted. You can see those markers will stay on them now. So you, if there were lots of other black headed girls in there, great black back girls in there, sorry, you would know these two had already been counted. And they have also appeared in the counter cell, so that number is figured. So type two, which is that color marker, has got two birds in it now. Um, so we move around the image again. If we zoom up a bit, we might want to separate flying birds out from birds that are actually on the rock. So maybe we, we could say flying birds are type four. Again, we go back up to here, to the pointer tool, put the marker on there. Um, type 4 has got one now, and then uh, have another look. But what we'll do now, we'll go to the top of the image, scan across, 
And these are the first birds that you come across if you are scanning from the left. So we'll put, we'll call these type three and we'll zoom in a little bit more. Okay. Now we go to the pointer tool again. And now uh, this marker is blue. It's better to, it's not going to stand out so well on the white. So you always put it on the dark part, part of the bird. You can just work through the image, just clicking on the bird as you go. You know, if you want to, when you finish doing your count, you can come back and have a quick scan through and see if you notice any, any birds without a marker on them. What I usually do is I start at the top, scroll across, and every time I come across birds, I will I'll mark them and then, then just work my way down the image back and forth basically until you've completed that. So uh, at that point, um, so I'm not going to go all the way through it because that's it effectively. You just keep counting. It keeps a counter for you. It marks everything you've counted. Uh, you can press results. If you click on results when you have finished, uh, you, again, you get an Excel spreadsheet which tells you you've counted two birds of type two, uh, 16 of type one and one of type four. Uh, and you can also export the image. So now this is the image with the with the counters on it. Uh, just go into there, save as, as ever, trape, yeah, save as, you know, JPEG, uh, the desktop. And you can do the same with Excel Street, of course. Um, job done, basically. Um, <clears throat> so the manual counter is really quick. It is uh, really straightforward. And so at this point, I will go back to the presentation and we will move quickly through now. <clears throat> so, okay. Uh, I did actually count the birds on here uh, because it was um, it was a winter character. So this is a day when all the birds came back in winter, and uh, I was curious to know how many of what proportion of the breeding birds came back. Uh, so I actually did that count. It took me about 45 minutes, and there weren't as many birds on there as you might think. Uh, okay, so again, I've given you the settings and the process for a manual count. Uh, for the guinea moth colony there. Um, okay, so we zoom in. This is uh, just um, a clip, just a, a crop from that image that, you, that I've just saved, where you have got, you can see the markers on the birds that have been counted. So, you, you know, you have a record of that also. So the pros and cons of manual counts, well, they're almost more, they're always more accurate than an automatic count because you can see what you're counting, you're putting the marker on there. You can count two to three thousand birds in the time it takes the best, it takes times it takes to find the best automatic settings sometimes. You know, it, it, that, that can be quite tricky, particularly if, um, <clears throat> if there's any noise in the, in, in the image. Uh, you have the option to count eight species at the same time. You have the marker being left on every bird, which has which rules out the potential for double counting and they're being distracted or losing count. You can even go for a cup of tea in the middle if you get bored, which you will do. Uh, the only disadvantage is the amount of time and concentration that it would take to count large flocks of birds, such as winter flocks of starlings and waders. You know, it, that would just be impossible, I think, yeah. and probably a lot less accurate than. Uh, I would say the automatic counter because you you would be trying to guess how many birds are in those clusters. At least you have a formula, you know, you 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 set some sort of formula for estimating how many birds are in those clusters, particularly the larger clusters. Um, that would be very difficult to do by eye. Um, okay, so before I finish, I was just going to show you a couple of images from Doniana. So all the photographs, all the images I've shown you so far. Uh, they were either, so the flamingo image was taken from a light aircraft uh, and the, um, the guillemot colony image was taken from land using just the, 
handheld camera, of course. And so the, the same with the case of the starlings and the linear photograph and the golden feathers. So, so lots of options. This, this image from Doniana shows a, a breeding colony of slender billed gulls. And this was taken by drone. And there are a few things you can see here that are highlighted. Um, so uh, the birds in yellow, in yellow circles are not slender billed gulls, they are black headed gulls. You can see the black heads there. Uh, the, in red circles, you have, uh, you have two standing slender billed gulls. And you can tell they are standing because you can see the shadows. In the purple circle here, you have a, a slender billed gull that is sitting. So it is, it is down and you, you cannot see any shadows, so you know that it's down. In the blue circles, you can also see eggs. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, and using a different form of segmentation, but it's the same sort of principles as image J. Uh, this was how they mapped out the breeding colony of the slender bill girls and the black headed girls. And the, the person who did this work is on the panel today for us, so that's. Uh, if you have any questions about this, feel, also feel free to ask about this. And Ricardo, the Delgado, who works at Doniana on the remote sensing side of things, will uh, pick, any, pick up any questions on this. Side. So in summary, um, just to finish off now, uh, when using image day for bird counts, only use the automatic counter if the individual birds are clearly visible against a, a plain background. The manual counter is the only option where you have a noisy background. Uh, the image, uh, the automatic count is based on object based image analysis. So any overlapping birds are counted as one object. In complex, complex flocks, you can improve on the accuracy the way we did now uh, by running a series of counts based on the approximate area of individual birds. Uh, the counts can be validated uh, by checking the image manually and estimating the number of the overlapping birds and cross referencing to the Excel file. Uh, flocks of up to 3,000 birds. Personally, I, I would almost go straight to, an, uh, straight to a manual count. It will be more accurate and it, you know, it won't take much more time. Uh, and of course, with a manual count, if you have mixed uh, groups of birds and they're mixed flocks of ducks or things like that, then uh, you can actually do those at the same time. Uh, so finally, if you'd like more information about the practical application of image J and the use of drones as well as other image seg segmentation methods at Doniana, there are chapters on this and other applications in this book, uh, which is on uh, the roles of remote sensing in nature conservation. And there's a link there if you are interested. You, you can buy the individual chapters, I understand as well. You don't, I mean, the book is quite expensive, but there are the, if there are chapters in there, you'd be particularly interested and you can buy them individually. Um, and, and again, this will be, I'll, I'll make sure this information is in, the, uh, is in the presentation that gets saved on the Eurocyte website. Okay, I, at that point, I will thank you all for your attention and, uh, uh, and I will stop sharing my screen now and hand over to, back to Wojtek, I think. Thanks a lot, Clive. It was really, really, very interesting. Even for me, as I'm botanist, <laughs> but but I al uh, already started to think how could I count some clumps of uh, of grasses or sedges with uh, image J. Um, but it's very important that it's open source, it's free software, uh, and it's uh, quite quite easy to start it. You don't need a, a very special knowledge about uh, analysis. Uh, but we, ha we have uh, some more detailed questions in our Q&A session. Uh, and uh, before we start with that, I would like to, uh, to invite here, here our panelists. Uh, and uh, the first of them is uh, Ricardo Diaz Delgado. Uh, uh, he works in the Doñana Biological Station, belonging to Spanish uh, International Research Council in Sevilla, uh, leading the remote sensing and GIS uh, laboratory. Uh, he also leads the long-term ecological monitoring and, uh, and las uh, at landscape scale uh, at uh, Doñana uh, pro protected area. 
Uh, and he's generally interested in the application of remote sensing and spatial information systems to ecological monitoring, especially the disturbance processes and biological conservation. Uh, so I would like to uh, invite you here, Ricardo, and I've seen that you already uh, answered uh, quite, quite a lot of questions uh, to, uh, to Clive, but Perhaps there are still some uh, some questions that uh, that need uh, that might uh, be answered by Clive uh, uh, live. Ricardo, thank you, Voltec. Thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction. Yes, I, I took the chance to to answer uh, several questions, uh, um, mostly the ones related to to the main issues I deal with. Uh, um, some people, some attendees, uh, just pointed out the possibility, the obvious possibility the, to use drones for this purpose. And, and it's true, actually, I may say, um, there's, there's nowadays hundreds of papers uh, showing how, how, how to deal with mapping and, account, and counting, uh, mainly nets, nests, bird nets in colonies uh, rather than flocks. Uh, obviously, um, so we have some examples, and, and Clive showed uh, one example for the slender bird colonies. And this is very useful when you have colonies in a very flat area with a very clear background again, and with no uh, tall vegetation around. And this is something that you have to deal with. Um, there was also uh, questions about the possibility to to remove the uh, background somehow by applying, you know, Photoshop techniques or a reduction. Uh, but uh, I try to to, uh, to to answer by by saying think of the main procedure is always to reduce the image depth. I mean, uh, to convert the image into a binary image because this will allow the program or any algorithm. To deal with the with the original data, but obviously you can also. There was a question about the possibility to to use uh, machine learning uh, classification procedures, of course, and that was we have an example dealing with uh, using uh, random forests. And by the way, we compare random forests with uh, supervised class, uh, supervised classification using random forests with uh, the uh, image J, and the results were pretty similar. And, and the interesting thing is, and I want to uh, stress, is the, that this is very recommendable that you always have manual counting because you need validation. You can do carry out your validation by just selecting uh, certain areas of the images, of course, uh, and reducing the number of, 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 of birds that you have to come for. But the point is that you have to do it. Otherwise, you don't have, a, a, you will never find automatically an exact figure of the uh, birds that, uh, that are present in your picture because you don't have any validation. So you have to carry out your own validation to uh, at least to, to have a, a, an accuracy assessment of, the, of your algorithm. Where red, uh, whatever the algorithm you choose uh, for this purpose. And I think with this, uh, most of the questions dealing with that uh, were a little bit addressed. But the point is, if you want to still comment on that, um, uh, we are open to, to, to receive, still open the discussion and, and see other, other uh, method, methods to deal with uh, counting birds using drones, for instance, and, uh, and I can uh, obviously share with you uh, many publications that are, are, are trying to address this this interesting issue. Um, I'm, I'm open for that and at the other side, I think about it that you will be able to, to, to still receive questions about that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. And I've got a great pleasure now to introduce uh, our next uh, panelist. Uh, but please, Ricardo, stay with us. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Alan Brown. Uh, he's also a member of our Eurosight Remote Sensing Support Group and he recently retired as Senior Remote uh, Sensing Manager at, at Natural Resources Wales, the UK agency responsible for the environment and nature conservation in, uh, in Wales. And his background is in upland ecology, vegetation
Station Survey Multivariate Analysis Habitat Monitoring in Satellite Remote uh, Sensing. And he has been using ImageJ for nearly a decade. Uh, so I'm sure that he, he got some, some more uh, comments uh, connected with that uh, software. Alan, could you join us? Could you switch on the, your camera? Okay, um, my camera should be on, is that right? Can you see me? Yes, we can see you, it's great. Okay. Um, yeah, um, okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I, I should also say that I've been working with Clive for, gosh, 20 years, more than that, Clive, I guess. Um, so we're, we're, we, we work together quite a lot. Um, most of the questions that have come in have been relating to the, if you like, some additional pre-processing um, that might be appropriate for um, improving the images before um, carrying out the counts. And, and in fact, um, probably much more so than QGIS, which we looked at last time, Image J has the capability of uh, doing a, a lot of very sophisticated contrast stretching. And so it's often possible to bring out uh, colors in the image. For example, where you've got birds that have even got a slight contrast with the background. And you can, you can enhance this. So you can, you, can, um, you can create an image that doesn't look natural, but has got a, a, a lot more um, uh, identifiable differences between the objects you're interested in and, and other objects. And of course, you've got red, green, and blue. Um, in, in, a, in a conventional camera, sometimes you've got near infrared. So you can combine these, um, these different channels in different ways as well. And maybe that's something that if people are interested, we could talk about afterwards. We'd be very happy to um, be sent images and have a go at seeing if we can improve the contrast between them. So that's the first thing. I think there is a good range of pre-processing options available. And image A is a very good uh, package to uh, use for this. The second thing is that um, it's also um, possible to remove the, the little dots that Clive was talking about. You can do it using methods, for example, by eroding the image. So when you've converted your image to black and white pixels, you can then erode around the edge of the objects. And this is actually very effective if, for example, you've got birds that so if you've got wings that are just touching and you erode the object that the pixels around the outside, then it separates them. Um, so there may be possibilities there as well to improve the, the automatic part of the count. Um, the, the third question was relating to um, machine learning. Now, one of the obvious things that um, Image J is doing in, in class presentation is is counting birds according to area, but it's not using any of the properties of the shapes of the birds. And I think it, it would be very interesting to look at using uh, machine learning to identify individual birds. So in other words, if you've got a, um, an object that has a, a, that's potentially an individual bird, but you're not sure, one of the easiest things to do in machine learning is to look for similar objects that have got a similar shape. Um, so I think that there, there, there is, as, as Ricardo was saying, there's an awful lot of literature on this. And I think there's a lot of sophistication that we can, we can use to, um, to develop automatic processing so that we're reducing the amount of um, interaction, of, of manual intervention as much as possible. And, and of course, if you have to make manual counts, um, again, you don't necessarily have to count the whole image you can uh, uh, create sample areas and count the sample areas and then use something like the density of, um, in Clive's case, dark pixels on the image to um, create a, a, a covariable that would allow you to weight your samples to, um, uh, to produce a, a, a weighted estimate for the whole image. So, so the there's also be sampling operations uh, and, and, and 
if you wanted to be very sophisticated, you could then use the covariable to um, uh, control the the number and density of samples using something like a PPP method. Again, it's a little bit sophisticated for what we took for, for, for this webinar, but it, it's just to show that there are other directions in which you can go. It doesn't have to be just automatic and just manual. Um, uh, Wojciech, is that enough on bird counts? Uh, I cannot see probably any more uh, questions uh, now, but still we, we th thanks a lot, Alan, for, for, for your great follow-up. Uh, and uh, and uh, maybe would ask Clive also again to, uh, to add something to, to these answers. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, looking at some of the questions here, I mean, the uh, the technique, uh, has it been used on sitting birds on water at a distance? Yeah, I mean, we could have used images, uh, again, taken at Doniana by light aircraft, looking down at some of um, some of the pools at, Lu at, uh, at Doniana, where there were flamingos and egrets, and, and you could see a size differential between the birds. So again, you, you could actually, be because the birds there are in one plane, then, uh, it would be very easy to to do an automatic count, but actually almost just as quick to do a manual count in in those situations. It's only, yeah, like I said, the difference in time actually isn't that great between those, doing those things if you're less than a thousand birds. The uh, uh, one of the things I would say is uh, when I was, um, I mean, what what you've got to be careful of when you you are sort of post. Uh, uh, do, doing some pre-processing, certainly in Photoshop, I, I tried doing this and I tried to flatten out the background, for example, of the um, uh, one of the images that we were, that I was thinking of using for this. And uh, when you were doing that, you actually lost some birds in the process. So by, by sort of it increasing the contrast, some of the smaller birds disappeared. So I actually, I, I defaulted back to the original image because in trying to flatten out the, the contrast, uh, it, it, it actually it started to affect the totals and not in a small way either. It was sort of, a, you'd lost almost a thousand birds from, from doing the comparable counts. Um, so I, I also, I'm, I'm coming at this mostly from um, a practitioner's end. So something that we can do quickly, uh, something that's, you know, we, we, use, um, we, we use volunteers uh, like I say, who've not been trained uh, to, to do lots of these bird camps of large flocks of waders and ducks and things like this. And, th and their counts are not validated any, any way either. But, but then you, you see the, the levels of variation here, even relatively small flocks of birds, you know, small groups of birds. It, it's huge. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't see how in, in this day and age, really, we, why we shouldn't be exploring different ways of doing this. And that, that, like, as I said right at the start, when, one of the first things we have to do is actually get used to taking a camera out of this. Because you haven't got an image, you've got nothing to count. Now, I, I think there's a question come in about integrating into citizen science. I think it should be. I, I think uh, image J, you know, the, you know, the instructions that are in the, in the presentation here, they're pretty simple. They, they don't go into the detail of, or, or require the expertise that Alan and Ricardo have been talking about when you, you start, to start, start to explore the, the possibilities of uh, other forms of segmentation within both within ImageJ and within other programs. But, you know, you can, a lot of this could be made available to, um, to volunteers. Uh, uh, with, with a relatively minimum, minimal amount of training. Um, uh, and it, it would have to improve the accuracy of the stuff we're including. And the, these counts get published, you know. Uh, uh, and that there's no attempt to put uh, a, an amount you know, of variation associated with these figures anyway. And yet we are treated, you know, they're, they're generally treated as if they're uh, scientifically valid and they're, they're published in lots of places. They were collected by volunteers with no training and no validation, basically. Uh, the people involved in this trial were mostly professional ornithologists who've done a lot of counting and, like I said, very experienced counters, bird counters also. And if you've got that much variation, it, it's actually difficult to imagine that if you picked a random group of people off the street 
and ask them the same question, whether, they, whether the range of variation would actually be any worse. So I, I think we have to explore you know, better ways of doing this. And then actually taking a camera out and taking a photograph uh, is a pretty good start because <laughs> at least you can go somewhere from there. Yeah, so, th so this is my opinion on this at least. And uh, I, I think we really ought to be thinking about uh, if we're going to engage volunteers in citizen science and these types of camps, we, we should be moving forward a little bit from seeing a, a flock of birds and having to guess how many there are and writing that down as the total and then publishing it. I think we need to go somewhere else from there. Okay, so, so that, that's me having that rant over. Thanks a lot, Clive. Any new comments? Ricardo, Alan, do you have something in mind? I think that uh, that question connected with machine learning, it was very interesting and it shows a further development in view of big data analysis, which is, uh, well, really uh, quickly developing. I think we could uh, still think about these improvements. But uh, but as Clive said, so, sometimes in in that uh, bird cans uh, we have just this this particular flock or one or two. So when we start to uh, to learn <laughs> about it, uh, we 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 need to count another one. <laughs> so uh, it's not it's not that easy. So so always. And probably it's good that still in this ecological science we we use this manu manual counting and with some help because of course we could do it on paper but uh, with e image it's it's really easy to just to uh, just to click even uh, manually so I, I I still think that these traditional methods are important but it, it, the most important is to to have this uh, this bridge between traditions and some new new approaches and this image is exactly in between. Uh, these two uh, two approaches and and of course still you need to how to identify species for example and you need uh, an ecological uh, knowledge for that so it's uh, but uh, but we still can uh, use the help of volunteers as as Clive said. But, uh, but also uh, Wojtek I mean also you, um, you have a photograph so you know experts will be able to identify often the species from the photograph in the point I'm trying to make here is without the photograph you can't go anywhere. You know, you cannot improve anything. So, so that is the first thing is that we have to, if we can, if we can get people going out with a wide angle lens on their camera to do their bird counts or a wide lens, a wide angle function, um, then, then, then that's a, a big step in the right direction because we can always look at the other ways to do this after that. Without the image you can't do it. So, so we have to have some sort of change of culture at least to get started. Yes, exactly. I, I see there's another uh, question from Tillman. Uh, Clive, have you published this trial with bird watchers and accounting flocks? It would be interesting to show this to colleagues. We uh, should organize training activities on photographing flying birds as well. Yeah. It's from Tillman Dieselhoff from NABU. Yeah, Tillman, yeah. Uh, th this, um, th the counts and the, um, the variation data that was published in this book that is referenced at the end of the presentation. So. Uh, that will uh, be in the presentation that's posted on the Eurosite website. So yeah, that, 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 um, a lot, about half of what I showed you today is actually in that book, particularly to do with the observer variation end of things. Mm -hmm. And I see that, so some new uh, short questions growing in Q&A. Are there any issues with stitching images together and then processing from uh, Michael Meadows? I may I may say that uh, actually for images acquired uh, from drone, this is a a, a very uh, essential procedure before dealing with uh, identifying objects in the image or classifying them. Is to stitch the images or what we say we call mosaic the images. So it's 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 very. Uh, useful. The point with this is uh, that you cannot, you can have these problems of overlapping uh, uh, pictures that may hide some of the elements in the image, like in this case, birds. So you can finally have a very nice mosaic, and then if by 
if you have moving birds, you can lose one of these moving birds uh, because it has been overlapped by the the next picture acquired. So, but yes, indeed, you can you can I mosaic can deal with that. I mean, there's that 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 component of the mosaic and like say from drones, which I know Ricardo does that a lot. Uh, but you can also, um, if you're in the field, I mean, I went out last year. And it's, uh, I noticed a huge flock of Canada geese that appeared from, from nowhere and uh, far too many to get one image. So I took a panoramic, basically, of a, a load of different images and effectively stitched them together and did a, a count. Uh, I mean, what you have to bear in mind with this, this stuff is that, you know, when you do a stitch images together like that, you, use a, you, you lose a few, a few birds. But if you don't do it, you lose perhaps 30% uh, of them, just on observer variation. You know, so losing a few birds, because it's not 100% accurate, so it's actually uh, probably 30% or 40% more accurate than if you did it any other way. So um, you're, you're improving the accuracy. You're not saying, you know, when you stitch things together, you're always running the potential of either increasing the number by a few or losing a few. But th these are small numbers compared to the numbers involved in, in not doing this thing, in doing sort of by eye counts. So, yeah, okay, so uh, I don't know. I, I guess we're getting close to. Uh, to our Unfortunately, time. it's true. Uh, so uh, just at uh, the end of our meeting and of our series, I would like to say a few words. Just uh, many thanks to you, Clive, for, for today and for our panelists and for other persons that uh, kindly co cooperated with us uh, uh, during uh, other meetings. Uh, and I think it was very interesting even for us organizing them. Uh, so <laughs> we, we are still listening to you uh, talking about that. So. Uh, and uh, and we'd like uh, to to continue with uh, with our meetings after after summer season. Uh, so we've we've got contacts to all of the attendees. So so we'll inform you soon about uh, further uh, steps connected with uh, with that uh, webinars because we really, really found it really really uh, very very interesting. And we found that there were a lot of people uh, joining uh, all three uh, all three web. Uh, webinars uh, so uh, thanks a lot again for your uh, for your uh, attention uh, and uh, see you soon back uh, after uh, after summer uh, season uh, I will uh, stop recording soon but I will leave it uh, leave the meeting open for for a few minutes something like five, five minutes so you can still chat and uh, talk uh, with each other with our panelists our speaker uh, so 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 officially we are closing our session. Uh, we are closing our uh, series of webinars. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for uh, to to all of you for for being with us today, and uh, I wish you, uh, I would say, safe and uh, and healthy uh, holiday. We hope that uh, desp despite this crazy situation around you, you still uh, are able to find some some place in nature to to hide and to to count birds uh, during uh, during this uh, this summer. Thanks a lot.